Hey folks, it's that time again. It's time for another session, Get to Know Diana Trace. I'm your host today, Jonesy, and uh, I'm going to be walking you through a couple of segments, and then we're going to turn it over to our guest solution engineer today. Uh, today we have Brian, who's going to be walking us through a demonstration of Dynatrace. As always, with Get to Know Dynatrace, what makes these sessions so special and so unique and so fun it's your participation, it's your questions. So, however you are listening to us today, if it be uh, YouTube, if it's on LinkedIn, if it's on Facebook, if it's on Twitch, uh, whatever it might be, feel free to go ahead and ask us a question. We'll be able to pick that question up and hopefully we'll be able to answer it. That's what really makes these Get to Know Dynatrace sessions so special. So let's get into today's content. Now, as always, with Get to Know Dynatrace, we always start off with um, a session, a segment that we call, uh, you know, essentially what's new. So let's get into the what's new. So here we go. And let me just sort of start things off here. What's new? Always. What's new with Dynatrace? Go to dynatrace.com slash news slash blog. That's where you're going to find out all of the new stuff uh, that's going on about Dynatrace, whether it's news, uh, whether it's uh, you know blog content, whether it's product information, release notes, all gets published to this location. Now, this week, this is kind of interesting because we actually released our first global impact report. And we're very proud to be able to do this. Um, you know, it's a, obviously as, a, as an organization, it's a responsible thing to do. And so we've just started to, to release these global impact reports. And at the same time that we've released this global impact report, you can see here one of the items in our, our uh, you know, on our blog site is that we've actually released an app that allows us to essentially track your IT carbon footprint using Dynatrace. So this app is actually built on top of our application framework, which is part of our newest platform. And this is something that you can go to the Dynatrace hub to actually download and add to your instance of, of Dynatrace. So that actually, you know, uh, leads us into our next segment. Actually, before I get there, there's something I do want to talk about. I forgot. And that is, how could I forget about this? I want to talk about Perform 2024 in Las Vegas. So folks, uh, I would highly recommend that if you're interested in going, now is the time to sign up. I think I heard somewhere that, uh, you know, in the next couple of weeks that the uh, the fees associated with attending uh, Perform might go up because it usually happens. The closer we get to the date, the, you know, we, the fees uh, tend to get increased a bit here. But you can attend in person in Las Vegas at our new venue, the Aria Hotel, and that'll be January 29th to February 1st. Now, I've attended these in the past. I have to tell you, they are fabulous sessions. They are so informative. They are so much fun. Uh, I highly, highly recommend it. The first two days or the day and a half, you know, typically what we have is our hot days. Hot days stands for hands-on training. That's where you get to sit down and actually work with instructors and go through different, uh, you know, different areas of the Dynatrace platform that are of interest to you and get that sort of hands-on exposure. They have to be, you know, uh, honestly, one of the most uh, well-reviewed, well-received uh, components of the actual Perform Conference. But that being said, we always have a, you know, an immense, uh, you know, wealth of topics that, um, you know, people bring to the Perform Conference, all sorts of different industry segments, whether it's banking and finance, whether it's travel, retail, you're going to find content that's going to interest you and you're going to hear stories of how people have been using Dynatrace to really solve you know their business problems and business needs and we always have fabulous keynote speakers and you know our 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 you know our senior people are always there and they're always engaging and so much fun and entertaining to listen to so again I highly, highly recommend that if you can get down to Vegas to attend this year's Perform, that you do that. I'll definitely be down there, and I hope to see you there. So let's move on to the next. 
And the next segment of Get to Know Dynatrace is Did You Know? Now, I kind of alluded to this uh, in the uh, What's New segment. I, I hinted at it. I, I was going to talk about Did You Know that Dynatrace provides the Dynatrace Hub? And the hub is where you can find hundreds of different integrations into various technologies. The Dynatrace Hub, and we'll, we'll, we'll take a moment during our demo today, and hopefully Brian will uh, be able to actually walk us through an example of you know, how, you know, how you use the hub, how you can search it and find different technologies uh, that you can integrate with, with Dynatrace. But this is you know, literally hundreds of different technologies, whether or not it's technologies that are you know, your you know, traditional IT hardware infrastructure where you maybe you want to monitor a switch using SNMP, or maybe it's something new like a specific cloud-based, you know, uh, enhanced service. Uh, like maybe you're wanting to monitor uh, Azure Cognitive AI as an example. This is something that now we can get metrics from and directly ingest it inside of Dynatrace. All sorts of different technologies exist within that Dynatrace hub. And if you weren't aware of it, uh, I'll draw your attention to it and we'll show it to you in the demo. But that is where you go to find the technologies that you need to monitor and how you just plug them right into Dynatrace. In many cases, it's simple as just a couple of clicks, maybe filling out a couple of form items, and that's all it takes to get these integrations up and running. So uh, keep an eye open for that, the Dynatrace hub. Now, let's move on to why everyone is here, which is the best part of Get to Know Dynatrace, and that's the demo. So it's demo time, and as I mentioned, this week our guest solution here is Brian. Brian, that's a uh, dude, absolutely dashing. You you look like uh, you know James Bond there, man. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jonesy. Yeah, so... For everybody uh, on the stream today, I am a SE with Dynatrace, a little bit newer to the SE team, but I actually come from our services background. So I had to come in rep services. We don't always get to be on these uh, big streams and out to everybody. So if you're wondering how to fit your uh, you know, Dynatrace into your ecosystem and make an enterprise solution, uh, ACE Services is always there to help you know, with best practices, implementation, and building out Dynatrace so it's a solution that works across your organization for you. That's fabulous. All right. Well, Brian, we're going we're gonna to let you get set up. And while you're doing that, I can see that we've got people coming in from all over the globe. Like we, we have now a global audience. This is fabulous. Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for attending. Remember, as I mentioned at the very beginning of today's, uh, today's segment, um, what makes Get to Know Dynatrace so special are going to be your questions. So let's get into the demo. Feel free to ask questions. We'll take breaks occasionally through the demo to answer those questions. And uh, with that, hey, Brian, the floor is yours. Perfect. Well, welcome, everybody. So for those of us that you know, know Dynatrace well, um, I'm happy to have you here. If you don't, hopefully we can walk through and get you introduced today. So right now, what I'm showing is the SmartScape. So with Dynatrace, we have a technology called the One Agent that provides full stack observability of your ecosystem, of your environment. And so the whole purpose of Dynatrace is to get that full observability of your environment so that we can understand when transactions aren't working well, when things go wrong in your environment, where's the problem at, and we can provide answers for you instead of just you know, data on glass. And so when we deploy the agent into your environment directly, we're going to be able to go out and auto discover things in your environment. So when we deploy at the host level, we're going to get that host information, rich metadata that I'll show as we move through the demo today. And then we're going to be able to see the processes on that host, the transactions that are handled and where those hosts are running. And this is agnostic of, you know, we can do Linux, Windows, it doesn't matter if we're deployed in AWS, on-prem, Azure. The beauty of the One Agent and the power of it and the reason why we call it part of our secret sauce is because it can be deployed anywhere. And it's going to auto-discover instrument and get that full stack visibility right out of the box. And with the SmartScape topology, 
Dynatrace is actually going to map those interactions within your environment so that we can see, you know, what process is talking to what process? What requests is it handling? How is that request moving through your environment? And how is it being affected each step of the way? Or how is a host performing? And where is that host at in your uh, data centers, in your ecosystem, and how does it interact with other things? So as we move forward and we deploy the agent, we're gonna automatically discover those entities. And when things go wrong, we're gonna be able to analyze them with the Davis AI. And so as I walk through today, I'll point out, you know, where, you know, that what we grab, the information that we're able to see. But I love starting with this problem card here because it really shows the power and the value of Dynatrace, right? Hey, Brian. Yeah. Brian, uh, just one, one, one quick second. You know, I, I always find that, you know, when we talk about Dynatrace, we often pick up uh, Dynatrace jargon, right? And, and yeah. we use terms that maybe people who are new to Dynatrace, you know, aren't really familiar with. I'm going to throw this one out. Uh, how would you describe, uh, you use the term entity, right? Inside yeah. of the context of Dynatrace. How would you describe an entity? What do we yeah. mean by that? So when we're looking at impacted entities, it can mean a number of things. So for this problem card here, we have a little bit of a smaller visual resolution path and I'll kind of talk about this, but it's a great way to show the entities that are affected, right? Entities can be things from processes in our environment, Hosts can be an entity, uh, the requests, the services that handle those requests, like a web request service, that's an entity in our environment. And even those front end applications that we're monitoring, whether it's a web application or a mobile app, those will be entities as well. So it can be a few different things, but it's, it's the information that the agent's grabbing from different items. So a host, a process, you know, a front end application. And then we even get into, we have synthetic monitors as well. So and that can be an entity and that will go out and automatically test your application or we can just run a simple HTTP monitor. And, and do I have to do anything to configure these entities or do they just automatically get discovered? Yeah, so when we look at the SmartScape, it's a great way to understand that with this agent deployment, we're getting everything from that host and the processes down to the deep code level that I'll show. And then all the way to the front end where we are tracking how users interact with the application. That all happens with the one agent automatically out of the box. Wow, that's fabulous. All right, I'm sorry I interrupted you. We were talking about problems. Yeah, so when we're looking at problems, right? Dynatrace, this is the value and the beauty of the AI right? We have dashboards and I'll get to those lovely things. But when we talk about, you know, I don't want to sit in front of a dashboard and look at, you know, green and red screens and figure out what's going up or down. I want a tool that's going to be able to provide me answers out of the box. And that's the beauty of Davis. So we've talked about all those entities that we're looking at with the one agent, mapping them with Smartscape. We have Davis in the background, actually analyzing all of those to understand how they interact and then be able to baseline and look at those and say, all right, well, something's wrong here. And not just what's wrong, but when we look at our visual resolution path and we see the different events that occurred. So here at the top, we have eight ongoing events. So sometimes we see visual resolution paths with 30, 40 ongoing events, right? In a, you know, Gen 1 monitoring solution where we're just looking at metrics, we're just looking at, you know, a single baseline, those might be individual alerts, but Davis is going out and analyzing those and saying, hey, these are all connected. We're building this problem screen out for you, this visual resolution path, so you don't have to, and we're going to tell you how they're connected and what went wrong as we step through that. And with the problem, we're gonna be able to quickly understand what's affected. So did I have any SLOs affected? Did I have any you know, specific applications or services? We can see what's the business impact? How many users are affected by this problem? So here we have 145 and we can look at the affected service calls and we can actually step into, you know, what did it look like for those customers as they were impacted? And we have our impacted entities down below 
but we can go right into our root cause and analyze the failure degradation that Dynatrace pointed out. And so here we're going to be able to see right off the bat, so we had a failed request on our easy travel service, and we can see the 500 internal server error, the number of failed requests, and right with the one agent, right? This is all just provided with the one agent out of the box. We're going to be able to look at the stack traces of exceptions and begin to understand what happened. Along with that, the agent is pulling logs in from the application, from the host itself, from the process. And we're looking at, okay, you know, what connected logs do we have that happened when that problem occurred? And so here we can actually see up above where we were able to get the exception, right? That occurred, the message, the error, but we can actually go into the detailed logs that somebody provide here. And we can see that same item that we're pulling out and where it occurred. So in just you know two minutes, I'm able to get an alert from Dynatrace. I'm able to step in, look at what's the impact of that problem. And Davis has analyzed how that occurred. And then we're gonna be able to understand where that happened. And so I can actually step through the root cause here and dive into, okay, here's my service identified with the agent. And I can actually look at, you know, where is the failure rate? And so we could pull up store booking. So, so hold, hold on while that's coming up there, Brian. So we've got a question. And the question was, without logs, is there any way to identify the source of the 500 error or the reasons behind it? Yeah, that's a great question. So, and the beauty of Dynatrace and, you know, observability the whole goal is, you know, we want metrics, logs, and traces. And metrics are a great way of indicating what's going on in your environment. You know, that's what we want to see on a dashboard. That's what we want to report on. Logs are a great way of understanding, you know, what happened from a developer's point of view, what's getting sent out. But traces are kind of, I like to call them the source of truth. So here, we're not actually pulling from the logs. We're looking at the code level and we're understanding as this request moves through your environment, what was the actual exception that occurred? And so I can pull out and I'll get to our nice error screen here in a second, but I can go deep into that code level and understand what classes and methods did you know, this request move through and where did the problem occur? And so right here without logs, I'm actually gonna be able to see this 500 internal server error and the exception message. Now logs might give me a little bit more in-depth view around that exception message, right? But with the one agent and with peer pass or distributed traces down at that level, we're gonna be able to see where that happened. All right, perfect. Thanks, Brian. And that was a great question, folks. Remember, feel free to start asking those questions. That's what we're here for today. So Brian, keep going. Yeah, so from the trace itself, we're going to be able to walk through how that request moved through your environment. So I showcased, you know, the code level, the errors, but really a lot of the beauty of dying tracing of observability is the information that we're grabbing, right? This rich met metadata that we're grabbing, not only on the entities, but the requests themselves to understand what's going on and what's happening. I can look at the timing, I can look at the threads, but, you know, maybe I want to know where this happened. I can actually go in and look at the process itself and begin to understand, all right, what happened at this process, right? Or what is going on from here? And there's a few things I wanna step out of the problem right now and talk about, you know, what are we getting at a process level with Dynatrace? And with the one agent, right, we, we constantly are going back to this auto discovery. And it's just so powerful because with that, we're getting all of this rich metadata down here that we can actually pull up into tags and then use that to filter and organize the environment. So the value of that is when a problem happens, I'm actually able to go in and say, all right, well, I need to know what application that problem was a part of. I might want to know, you know who's in charge of that application. And I also want to know a few different items. And with tags, we're able to pull all of that out, all that data out of the entities, and then send that in a notification so that we can properly route it to the team it needs to go to. 
Uh, from a metric standpoint at a process level, we're looking at things like system performance, JVM metrics. So we're going to be able to understand the performance of the JVM. One of my favorite things with Java is the ability to actually profile and look at, you know, where we're allocating memory. It's very powerful. Over here on the right, I got to mention security. So we all know the log for j vulnerability that happened last year. And that was a big proponent of us, you know, a big proponent of our security standpoint. We're able to step in and at a process and host level, look at with the agent, any security vulnerabilities that are in your environment, because we're right there running with you. So instead of scanning, you know, your code before you release it, which I think many people will still do, we can actually look in runtime if there's any vulnerabilities out there. And we're going to be able to not just give you, okay, what's the security score um, that's provided by the industry, but with Davis, with the SmartScape, we have such a good understanding of your environment, we actually generate our own Davis security score. So we're going to look at things like, is that publicly exposed? Is there reachable data assets? So if you have multiple vulnerabilities in your environment, you know, maybe I got one on a host over here, but that's closed off on-prem and it's a dev host, right? I don't need to touch that. I need to touch, you know, the production one that it has public internet exposure, reachable data assets, a higher de uh, data security score. And from there, I'll be able to triage and quickly move through those. So with Dynatrace, we're not just focused on, you know, the APM portion as the application performance, but we're also focused on the security aspect as well. And if we move from here to the host, we're gonna be able to get more of a infrastructure view on what's happening. And so this host is running in AWS. Once again, with the agent and our AWS integration, we're able to actually go in and pull a lot of rich metadata about this host. And that goes back to, you know, the organizational piece of observability, right? As we manage our ecosystem, all these entities that we have, we want to be able to say, where are things at, who owns what, and the important parts of those. And so what we're actually doing here is not only are we looking at the host performance from an agent perspective, which I'll dive into what we get there, but we're actually pulling out as well specific AWS metrics. So we are looking at what AWS sees and then what the agent sees as well. And so under host performance, we're going to get simple things like CPU usage, memory usage, but we're actually going to be able to understand latency and network as well. And I can scroll down and we can see automatically what's running on this host, what technologies do I have? And so if I want to look at, you know, the Apache uh, processes that I have running, I can just click here and it's going to filter on all the Apache processes that I have. So I'll actually be able to go in and see, all right, these are all the app processes that I have on this host. Here's their performance and here's what's happening. And we can pull that right out into a dashboard and look at it from there as well. So whether you're on the infrastructure side or the application side, we're going to be able to provide visibility into that stack and show you, okay, here's where things are going wrong. And Davis is going to point you right to the root cause of that. So, so Brian, you know, earlier this week, I was on site with a, a major U.S. bank. And we got asked the question, wait a second, how do I, how do I tell if, um, you know, a method that's running hot, or if I got a trace that's taking up a lot of compute resources, how do I how do I tell what's going on at the host level and the process level? Like, do I have to have separate agents to do this, or you know, how do, how do you how does that actually work? Yeah, so everything is provided directly from the one agent. So when I go to the distributed trace. And I look at, all right, let's take one of these that's running a little bit longer. So we'll do this get enable plugins. I'm gonna be able to understand the timing of this uh, actual method that occurred. 
and I'll be able to go into the response time hotspots of that method. So I'm gonna be able to see the code execution, click down into the method hotspots. So that one didn't pull up exactly what I wanted, but we'll be able to understand, all right, if I have high CPU consumption and I click into this hotspot, what's happening, right? And that from you know that point of view, we're looking at the actual code, the request, but with the same agent, we're able to pull out and look at, you know, if I go to this service here, and now I'm gonna get rid of this problem time frame, I can actually go through each level as we did before. And I can look at the process and understand the system performance, right? Let's say I just wanna look at, you know, detailed CPU consumption. And if I wanna look at it from a process level, I can pull up that method hotspots and I'm gonna be able to see, okay, now here we have the method hotspot of that process, right? Of that specific service that's running. We can see what methods are breaking that down. And then if I wanna go back here and look at, okay, let's go to the host itself. And so now we're on a different, we're on a Windows host. I can go through and break down, you know, the CPU performance, other items, but at a process level, I can analyze all that here in terms of the, you know, the actual infrastructure usage of the process and what it's doing. And that all comes from the same agent. So, you know, we're not installing different agents across your tech stack. It's just that one agent that we're going out and we're deploying and it's very quick and easy. And, you know, we have a lot of automation around that to be able to go in and grab this information for you. Yeah, I think that, and that was the, the, what I wanted you to get to, which is it, it, this is all coming from a single agent. Um, you know, this conversation I was having, they were kind of incredulous that, you know, a single agent could actually pull out all of these different metrics coming from all of these different sources. You know, I've got my trace metrics, I've got my metrics off my process, I've got my host level metrics. And they're all interrelated. I'm not skipping from one to another. It's all there. So thanks for thanks for walking through that. I, I yeah. hey, keep going. Keep going, Brian. Yeah. And I you know, one of the things that I love to show as well for, you know, let's let's get out of you know a, a VM and the processes there, but we can actually look at if I pull up, you know, EK EKS here, for example, right? And let's just dive into one of these nodes. So this is that same agent that's going out and pulling information from Kubernetes. So whether we are at a, you know, on a VM or even a physical host, right? It's all the same deployment. It's gonna feel very similar in terms of what we're pulling, what we're grabbing. And so we're actually able to go in and take, you know, one of these pods, for example, and we're gonna be able to understand off the bat, all right, you know, with the Kubernetes integration and the one agent to combine, you know, some of the data that we get about it, we're going to be able to see in Kubernetes, we're going to inject directly into those pods and look at what's happening in there as well. So, and that's all automatic out of the box with Dynatrace. So it's not really, uh, oh, I have to go and instrument on every single container that I have out there, or I have to go instrument, you know, on every single node, it's the agent gets deployed and then it's gonna automatically do that for you. We actually have an operator that can go out and it's gonna handle the life cycle of the agent. That's one of the things that I didn't mention, right? A lot of people, when they hear that term, they're worried about, you know, the one agent, all right, do I have to update it? What's the, you know, what's the upkeep to it? The one agent has the ability to go out and auto update, has the ability to go out and auto instrument into different processes, into different containers on its own so you're not going out and changing everything in your tech stack to get this visibility. Very cool. Hey, listen, we've got two questions in the queue. We've got a question about um, different types of services. And, and the question is, some in this person's environment, some are web services, some are web request services, and some are background activity services. So off the top of your head, can you explain a little bit about the difference? And then we'll get the second question, which is on business events. Yeah, so when we're looking at services in Dynatrace, let me just pull up the services page here. 
So when we're looking at services in Dynatrace, we're going to pick up different service types. So in terms of like a web request service that's actually handling customer requests, you know, incoming web requests, we get down to that deep code level. That's just the type of technology that we have. When we touch on things like messaging services, um, you know, message queues, those items, we're actually looking at, you know, the messages that are sent to and from those to understand the performance of those queues. If we're talking about like background activity specifically, that's just specific to your application in terms of, okay, those are just rec you know, requests executed on a background thread that we've identified and instrumented on. Very cool. All right. So hopefully that hopefully that explains a little bit about the services. The one th the other thing I would add to this is that you know typically uh, Dynatrace out of the box is going to automatically um, you know detect the type of service that uh, get you know that that we bubble up and expose in this screen. There's generally no configuration that's required. But that being said, that being said, if you do want to go in and more specifically uh, tailor the services and the way in which these services are being exposed, you can configure that. That is a configurable option. So you can go in and you could create custom entry points for services if there's a specific method or a specific class that's not associated necessarily with a traditional web request. You can go in and actually create a custom service entry point and then that service starts to show up inside of Dynatrace. So for the most part, this happens absolutely automatically, but you also have the option to go in and configure and tailor this to your needs. It, and I saw there was a comment there from Dane. I love the namespace selector from the cloud native full stack flavor. <laughs> it does save lives. That's a great quote. Thank you very much for that. That's awesome. Uh, okay. So we had another question, uh, which was around, oh, wait, hold on a second here. Uh, can we transfer summary data we see at trace level in the, to the Dynatrace dashboards? Uh, so can we see request attributes? So yeah. go ahead. Right. Yeah. So let me pull up uh, a trace here. I've been jumping around a lot of screens. So let's just take a second to pull up a specific trace. And then, so this one does have a request attribute on it. And it just pulled it up there. So when we're looking at summary data on a specific trace, there are different items that we can pull out. And you can view in the documentation the specific set of, we call them request attributes. So on that request, you know, there's specific items that we can pull out and actually showcase. So let's take, you know, on here, for example, if there's a specific, you know, response header or something that I want to pull and look at, you know, and then I want to filter requests off of that, you know, I can actually pull that into a dashboard. A great example of this is I had a customer who, you know, each payment, it was, uh, you know, a payment system. And every payment that came through had a specific, uh, its own specific ID on it. And so they wanted to be able to search for that ID. And we just created a request attribute on that. And then as those payments moved through their system, we were able to pull out where it went specifically and what happened to each payment. Or if they had to go back and look at one that got complained about, they could search that and pull exactly what happened. And you'd be able to put that on a dashboard as well. So, so Brian, this actually, this probably leads into our next question, which would be, a, which is going to be about business events. Mm -hmm. uh, but before we even get there, okay, so the request attributes, you know, the, um, you know, it's a very useful feature. Uh, it's an incredibly useful capability of being able to go in and look at a specific piece of, of business information that I want to pull out and I want to be able to track. But the challenge with it, the challenge with it is what happens when you get into a situation where the value for those attributes introduces a ridiculously high cardinality. Yeah. That's where things become really sort of challenging. And, and what do I mean by cardinality in this particular case? So the number of options, the number of results 
is you know is, is expansive so like when we've got like a lot of different types of resp- uh, of different attributes or attribute values in this case that can lead to cardinality concerns and so that that shows up when you try charting something like for, and this is common sense if i yeah. try charting something that has um you know a thousand different values over a period of time yeah, uh, it's going to be very hard to read that. It's going to be very hard to understand that. And you know, over the years, we've understood that organizations have challenges, especially when we start talking about masses of massive amounts of cardinality. And one of the things that we've been working on are business events. Now, Dane had—I think it was Dane had asked a question earlier on around business events, and I see there's a couple of other ones. Like uh, Tushar was asking about. Um, you know, how are business events different from, say, like normal events? Um, mm-hmm. Let's start there and then let's get in and get into Dane's question. If we can, let's show an example of what, you know, sort of the business events looks like. Right. Yeah. So when we're talking about business events or, well, let's go back to like this uh, Kubernetes, for example. Yeah. So let's start. Let's start here and di- yeah. differentiate between a business event and an event. Yeah. So when we're talking about like. The one agent, when we deploy to Kubernetes and we use the integration as well, or uh, when we're deployed on a process and the process goes out and crashes or restarts, or you deploy a pod and it fails, you know, or the readiness probe fails, right? Those are types of events that occur during deployments, that occur as, you know, things are running. And those kinds of things, obviously, we want to pull in, we want to look at, we want to analyze those, but they're connected to a specific entity, right? With business events, what we're able to do is we're actually able to go in and pull out, you know, just what it sounds like, specific key pieces to the business where we're not pulling from, you know, uh, a distributed trace request attribute, but a actual event that occurred and we're tracking that. So what we can see here is a, we call this our easy trade application. So uh, it's just a mock application that's going out and buying and selling stock. And we're going and we're tracking all of those items with business events. And so what we can see right here in the top, let's just look at this buy one. So just as simple, I can open this with uh, the query and it's going to pull out our DQL. So those familiar to uh, Grail and the newer Dynatrace feature, of Grail and DQL, we're actually able to go and query the business events that we post into Dynatrace and look for specific things like right here in just five lines, I'm able to pull out from all my events, okay, I want to see which ones are from Easy Trade specifically. I then want to look at the event type, right, which is a buy. And then I want to make sure, okay, the amount's not null, I don't need any, you know, zeros or anything. And then I'm just going to summarize in this last line here, the actual amount that I bought. And so I can go ahead and run this query. And it's just going to give us this single value of 440 because we summarized it with the count. And if I get rid of this right here, and then let's run that query again. These are the actual, this is the raw data of those business events. So we're actually going in and we're looking at the event that happened. You know, we have things like the price here. We're able to understand where that happened and what happened. And in this case, we're just taking all of that data from this table and we're summarizing it with one additional line to be able to provide you a single value that we can then go actually place onto a dashboard which I just exited out of there. So I'll go back and open that up. So that we're actually able to go out and pull onto a dashboard. Now we can see from here that we're able to pull a lot of different items and visualize them in a lot of different ways. So whether it's a specific table where we wanna pull out, you know, who's buying what, what's the amount that they're buying, or if we wanna look from, you know, a actual top list, you know, type, view for the top trade volume of account ID and see who is executing the most amount of trades, we can do things like that as well. So there's a couple of, uh, just because we're on this topic, there's a couple of follow-up questions that have sort of uh, 
you know, come up here. Um, you know, what defines business events? So, you know, business events are, you know, you, there is a, you go into the settings and you can define what the business events are. Now, business events could be, you know, it's, it's probably it's most simple instantiation would be um, the payload of a web request, right? So mm -hmm. I could, it could be a header value for that matter, but it could be also part of the payload. So you would be able to actually grab the payload, the JSON, and then using Dynatrace processing rules, be able to pull out the specific uh, field that you want to track as a business event. So this is, um, um, you know, it's, it's literally something that you, you know, configure uh, within Dynatrace. You, <coughs> as with all of our configuration, pardon me, uh, as with all of our configuration, you can also do this programmatically. We have a uh, uh, something that we call Monaco, which is essentially monitoring as code, which is a way for you to programmatically, uh, you know, control the configuration of Dynatrace. It's very much like Terraform. In certain cases, you could also use Terraform, but Monaco has more specific Dynatrace functionality available to it. And so you could programmatically pull out business events um, you know, from your projects if you need to. So right now, uh, most people that are using business events is usually on like a JSON payload. Uh, but I'm understanding within a couple of releases, we'll also be able to handle, um, you know, your, your traditional SOAP XML payloads as well. We're really excited about that because a lot. it's funny. I asked the question to a room full of people. And I said, how many of you guys are still using SOAP and XML? And uh, you know, a lot of people put up their hands and they go, oh, well, apparently SOAP is alive and well these days. Got a little bit of a chuckle there. So uh, there's a um, couple more questions here that we have going. Uh, somebody's asking here, news on if and, uh, if and when Grail will be available to Dynatrace managed. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going I'm, I'm to say, I'm not going to say never, but it's, it's, you know, if if it does happen, it's going to be a long way out. And the reason for it, quite simply, folks, is the way that Grail, our data lakehouse architecture works, is um, is is leveraging a lot of that parallel, massive parallel processing that the cloud avails to us. Uh, that we can spin up literally thousands of cores at a moment's notice to execute a um, you know execute a query. So because of the way that the cloud works, you know, we, we leverage a lot of that functionality, which honestly for an on-premise implementation, unless you have, you know, a massive amount of hardware available to you, a massive number of cores, it's, it would be impractical for the moment. So I'm not going to say no or never, but let's just say, uh, no time soon. Okay. So thanks for that question. Um, what else do we have here? Oh, this is back to the services. When one of the service rates, uh, uh, services failure rate increases, will we get an alert? How will it affect the application? Is there any static thresholds? So, so that's actually interesting. Brian, do we have a second to actually flip into a service and look at some of the anomaly detection rules? Yeah, so let's go to this service right here off of the smart skip, it will open for me. So when we're looking at a service, and the, the first thing that I always say to customers when they're starting off with Dynatrace is out of the box, we have those problem cards. And those are based off of anomaly detection and Davis's power behind those. And they happen right out of the box. So I always say get used to that first or try, you know, try it out first because, you know, the whole beauty of Dynatrace is, I don't have to build my observability solution, right? I deploy the agent, it's automated, it's easy. But when I wanna dive into a specific service and change the way that we're looking at alerting, we can actually go into the settings of that service and we have the ability to go in and edit the anomaly detection. So this is our demo environment, so I don't have all the keys to the kingdom, but I am able to read through the specific parts here where we can look at all right, response time, and we can understand the way that we're looking at that response time degradation. So if I want to change the way we have anomaly detection on a service, I can do that right here. Now, I think part of that question, if I can find it again, 
um, was also, if I remember correct, was around, you know, what if it's been happening for over 30 minutes in terms of response time degradation, or when we're looking at alerts, how long we want to wait to be alerted. That's all configured in the alerting profile. So with Dynatrace, right, we're identifying those problems out of the box and we can edit the way that, you know, the anomaly detection actually happens. But when it comes to alerting, we have a lot of power and capabilities just with, uh, you know, alerting profiles, which define what do I want to be alerted on? Essentially, I go in and I add the different types of Dynatrace alerts and then I can filter on tags or management zones or other items, right, to say, okay, that's what I want to be alerted on. And then we connect that to a problem notification. And a problem notification can be a number of things, whether email, a ServiceNow integration, a custom webhook, if we have, you know, a specific application in our environment that routes alerts. Um, so we have a number of ways to integrate alert, alerts in your environment today. And I could keep going on and on about workflows. I'd encourage everybody to check out our workflows. There's a lot of automation right in there around alerts and, turn, and a lot more functionality just outside of, all right, here's an alert and here's where I want to send it. So we've got another question here I'm just looking at. And, you know, this is kind of an interesting one. When, when let's just say an application admin stops the one agent on their server Mm -hmm. and the host goes into not monitored mode. Is there a way to get an alert off of that? Yeah, so it's been a while since I specifically tested that scenario out, but uh, mm -hmm. it should result in monitoring unavailable. Um, I would have to double check for you if you stopped it in the UI, because I know we do have the capability to go to a host in the UI and then stop it from there. I'd have to double check if that would resolve. Yeah. Monitoring. I'm also thinking that if we go into services, oh, go into the settings. Mm -hmm. If we go into the settings, I'm um, trying to remember. No, nah, not. Yeah, hold on a second oh, here. Not on the host sure. settings, but if we go into the um, anomaly detection rules, and I believe there's something new now called metric events. And yes. in the metric events, you could pick and choose different metrics that you would want to generate an anomaly from that could be attached to an alert profile to generate an actual outbound alert. I have a feeling that it's probably going to be somewhere in there. Yeah, so metric events are a great custom way of saying if I want to, you know, for whatever reason, I want to take a specific metric and then create an alert off of that. You know, a very simple example is, let's just say, for whatever reason, I want CPU usage at 40% sending an alert. I'd be able to put that in here, and then that would be sent as a custom event in Dynatrace, a custom alert to you. Yep. Uh, okay, what other questions did we have going on? Because they're coming in wildly now, and I'm yeah. starting to lose track. Oh. Can you feed business event data into problems to provide business impact? Oh, who's leading? Who's asking these leading questions? These are the types. Oh, actually, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a, a little bit of a pass on that question. The reason being is, is that I don't want to spoil some of the surprises that we have coming down the pipe in uh, our perform conference. Let's just say that that is a very astute question, and it is something that we are absolutely considering. And that's, you know, that's the that type of the announcement would be very exciting and that's the type of thing that we would announce at uh, at perform i i saw something else pop, flash up on the screen but i apologize i missed it uh oh will we it can, we can, can demo. We, let's do that yeah absolutely yeah so here's the carbon footprint impact and once again this is based off of business events and it's built on our new app engine so with App Engine, we're able to quickly build out, you know, views like this that are going to show you what's the actual carbon footprint of your applications. And so over here in the top, we're going to be able to quickly see, all right, you know, kilograms of CO2 in a selected uh, time period. And I'm just looking at the last three days. We can see that we're up over that time. So maybe we've had a, you know, a lot, you know, higher release and then that's causing uh, or more foot traffic that ends up resulting 
in a uh, higher impact. And then we can actually go down and look through our specific data sensors. So I can see if I have any host idling. Luckily for Dynatrace today in our demo environment, we're not wasting any technology. We're not over utilizing. So we can see what host we have scaling and then the actual energy that we're using in each data center and how that equivalates into CO2 usage. So this is just a super cool example of how those business events can be used. And, and to get back to Andrew's question about feeding the business event infra data into problems to provide business impact. Um, yeah, that data is there. Like this, honestly, you know, to, to Andrew's original question, of, uh, this just shows that we do have that data, pushing it into things like the problem card, you know, that's, that makes a lot of sense. And so you could imagine where we're going to be able to go with this. But as, a, as an example, so this carbon footprint app, um, you know, often we get asked uh, from organizations, you know, how, you know, can Dynatrace help us with uh, some of our, our ESG governance? And, you know, we want to be able to measure this. And this is a perfect example of how those business events allows us to actually now provide you know measurable results and these are the types of conversations that happen obviously at a very high you know, high level in an organization this is you know this is usually like board level conversations this is stuff that kind of makes its way into an annual report and uh, here's a perfect example of how Dynatrace is going beyond just traditional observability uh, traditional monitoring and now providing you know in this case really sort of business relevant information um, that's being used and viewed by investors so they can you know put the rubber stamp on and say hey this company is you know this is a and you know they're 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 a good corporate citizen they're good to the environment that type of thing what do we got some more questions here mm, do, 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 do. oh can you please explain the license needed for the workflows well, so let's first off show an example of a workflow. Let's do that yeah. and then let's explain how it's licensed. So I don't have any in our demo environment, but let's pull up the carts for liability. So when we're looking at a workflow, this is really where we get into some beautiful automation with Dynatrace. So as problems occur or as we do a release, uh, we want to be able to go and run automation against those. And there's a number of things that we can do. Uh, but those are just two quick examples to be able to take data with Dynatrace, execute our own logic against it, and then, you know, send notifications, uh, do remediation, right, or other items that we want to execute on our own with that Dynatrace data. And this event right here, so we're posting a event where we're saying, all right, a uh, application has been deployed into production. And we're going to run a validation with our site reliability guardian, which quick touch on, I'm not going to open it right now because of time, but the site reliability guardian is another application that we have that allows you to set up a series of tests against your application. So when I deploy into production as an SRE, let's say I have a bunch of SLOs I need to meet, um, or I just want to make sure there's no failures on that application. I run, want to run a synthetic monitor and that needs to run uh, completely, I'll be able to do that with the site reliability guardian. So I'll, in a production deployment, I'm going to go out and actually run this validation, which then is going to, you know, pass, fail. There might be a warning or uh, information that comes out of it. I'm going to go through and actually traverse our SmartScape to pull out the specific entities if there was a problem in that validation. And then off of that, with that entity, I'm gonna take it and figure out, all right, who owns it? So we're gonna pull from that, uh, you know, the previous uh, JS code that we ran, the logic that we ran, we're gonna pull out whatever entity it produced and we'll get the owner, we'll get the contact details, and then we're gonna send a Slack message. So if the site reliability and guardian said, hey, we had a failure, and we had a problem with this entity, we're actually gonna be able to go out and pull that, get the owner for it, their de contact details, and send them a detailed Slack message of what happened. 
Very cool. So, so folks, I, I wanted Brian to first explain what the workflows were, and then let's talk a little bit about the licensing. Licensing for the workflows, very straightforward. A workflow costs essentially $100 a month, right? As a matter of fact, when you do the math on it, if you look at it, it's basically about 14 cents an hour for a workflow to run. So, you know, is workflows for everything? No, not necessarily. Uh, but if you, this is the way that uh, I'm, I'm sort of phrasing it to people. If you have a task that could be automated and it takes a developer more than two hours a month to do that, that's a good candidate for one of these workflows. Like at, at that point, it just, you know, it, it literally, you know, it pays for itself. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's very simple workflow, hundred dollars a month per workflow. Again, like I said, don't use it for absolutely everything. You use it for those scenarios where, you know, if you got some process, some task that takes someone a couple of hours a month is probably a good candidate for using one of these workflows for. Yeah, we just had a great customer story uh, recently come out where every Thursday night they were logging on from like seven to 10 o'clock going out and testing their application and seeing whether it failed, they would sit there through the test and they turned that into a workflow, not only allowing them to stay home at night and not be on their laptop any more than they need to, but also saving the developers time. And if it did fail or if, it, you know, a warning went off, they would just get a message for that and then they could go remediate it or, you know, have a, a workflow that auto remediates it if there was a step to take. That's a great example. So thank you very much for that, Brian. Hey, folks, listen, it's the top of the hour. And uh, as always, you know, what makes these sessions great were your questions and you really hit us with a lot of questions this week and we really appreciate it. Those are great questions. Thank you very much for that. Brian, you did a fabulous job walking us through Dynatrace. Really appreciate you coming out. We're going to have you out again at some point in the future. And, and folks, uh, I invite you, if you haven't tried Dynatrace, feel free to go to Dynatrace.com and sign up for a free trial. It's not going to do anything like ask you something goofy, like for a credit card or something like that. Literally, you can sign up. We'll create an automated tenant for you, and you can just go ahead and start deploying those one agents. So feel free to take Dynatrace out for a spin. And we'll, we'll be back in a couple of weeks. I think it's October 5th is the next edition of Get to Know Dynatrace. And I'll close off with a, you know, a final plug. Hey, if you're interested in coming to perform, now's the time to get signed up. So do yourself a favor, save a few dollars, get signed up for Dynatrace Perform now. And with that, folks, thank you very much for your time. Brian, thank you. You did an awesome thank job. You for having me. All right on. And uh, folks, we'll see you next time on the next edition of Get to Know Dynatrace. <laughs>